I love talking about light. There are a lot of topics within that broader subject that are fairly straightforward, and there are a lot of things about light that are super complicated, but that's what always keeps it so interesting. Today we're going to talk about refraction. That's the word that we use for the bending of light. It's going to help us understand why when you put a drinking straw into a glass of water, it looks like it's cut in half right at the surface between the air and the water side of things. We're going to be able to put some mathematics behind this using some of the work done by a guy named Willebrord Snell, if you can handle that. He's got a fairly straightforward math equation that we'll be able to use called Snell's Law. In the second part to this video, I'm going to be able to discuss something called total internal reflection, which helps us understand a really pretty important topic that has allowed us to use fiber optics for communications. So it's pretty much revolutionized the way that we do things. To understand all of these topics, we need to bring up the idea of optical density. Remember that light is an electromagnetic wave, meaning that it has a oscillating electric field. It also has an oscillating magnetic field. But it shouldn't surprise you that an oscillating electric field is going to be able to sense the presence of charged particles. Given that all matter is made out of charged particles, namely the protons in the nucleus of atoms, and then electrons zipping around outside of the nucleus, and so this ultimately causes light to slow down as it's trying to pass through. It can pass through, but while it's passing around the nuclei, it has to slow down. The amount of slowing, again, is a property of a material. It has to do with how many different charged particles the light has to pass around. Given that we have this property optical density, we need a way to measure it so that we know how, how intensely it will slow light down. The way that we do that is with something called the index of refraction. This is going to basically tell us how much light slows down. It's something that we can measure in a lab. So the measure is the index of refraction. The property is the optical density. We can mathematically look at what the index of refraction means, and it's fairly straightforward. The index of refraction is the maximum speed of light, so that's the the constant C, 300 million meters per second in a vacuum, divided by how fast it actually moves in a particular material. And you can see that if it's going to slow down, that denominator is going to be smaller than the speed of light, and it's going to lead to indices of refraction that are one or greater. Here's a list of examples for you to look at. We, by definition, set the index of refraction for a vacuum equal to 1. And then you can see that the index of refraction goes up, not a huge amount, but it does go up for different natural materials. In order to deeper understand this subject, I'm going to take a brief aside and talk about something that just has to do with waves in general. Remember that equation down there in the bottom that says the velocity of a wave is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. But also remember that the velocity of a wave is decided by the medium. If a wave goes into a new medium, the velocity must instantly change. The frequency of a wave is decided by the source, and so that can't change either as long as the wave came from the same source. That means the only thing that can change is the wavelength. So I'm showing you a very simple model of a wave that's going into a different medium, and that medium is causing it to slow down, and you should see the wavelength get smaller. Notice that the wave is still connected. What I mean by that is look at this other variety. Same picture, except there should be something about this that doesn't sit well with you. If you look at that interface, this looks more like two different waves to me. It doesn't look like it could be the same wave. I'm not entirely sure how a wave would go and have a particular magnitude and then instantly change its mag magnitude. We say that the wave must be continuous as it crosses the interface. That is going to be really important for understanding why light actually bends. But go ahead and just hold on to that thought for a moment. Now we move to a different model for light so that we can try to put all the pieces together. Here I have this ladder looking thing coming in 
and it's traveling in the direction so that it's in air and it's coming in at an angle and it's about to hit a new interface, water. This is sometimes called the wavefront model for light. The way that it works is you should identify where the crests are through this electromagnetic wave picture that you might be more familiar with and you have several different peaks up there on that red. Well what I'm trying to show with the wavefront model is that all of the little rungs of these ladders, those are the crests, those are the peaks of the electric part of the wave. So here we are moving this wave with the wavefront model into a new material and it's coming in at an angle. When I move it in, if I didn't have any bending whatsoever, my wavelength still has to shrink because now I'm in the higher index of refraction material. That means the rungs of the ladder just got closer together. But you see that this causes a problem for me. In this region inside here, I might be able to match up one crest of the wave on the air side of things to the crest of the wave on the water side of things, therefore keeping that continuous like we were showing before. But as soon as I match it up over here, all of a sudden it's disjointed in this location and it's disjointed in this location. This location looks pretty good, it's nice and continuous, but I really need all portions of the wave to be continuous. The only way for me to have a smaller wavelength and have a continuous wave at all parts is to bend the wave. And so this is where we get this idea that the light's going to bend and this is what we call refraction. Always drawing the wavefront model would be a little complicated for us and so we drastically simplify this down and we just put these lines. So in a moment you're going to only see me putting that little blue line there but that's just identifying where the photon or the electric magnetic wave is coming into and where it's traveling through after it hits the interface. You also notice the dashed line that I put up there. We call that the normal line. That's where we measure all of our angles from. Before I go too deep into that, I have a different conceptual model that I like to use in the classroom that involves a car or truck moving across a surface and I'm saying that it's starting out in asphalt. The analogy means that that is a, a fast moving truck out there. So this is a low index of refraction and then it's going to hit a high index of refraction. In my analogy, this truck is going to run into mud. And you'll notice that as the truck comes in at an angle, the first tire that's going to actually get stuck in the mud is going to be the front right tire. The left tire is going to be able to move on the nice clean asphalt for a little bit longer than the right tire. But what that's going to do is that's going to slow down the right tire while the left tire is able to move nicely. And it's going to kick the direction of the truck a little bit. And so it's going to cause that turn. We could do the same thing coming the other direction. In this case, I would say that my front right tire is going to be able to grab traction on the asphalt first. And so as it moves up, that tire is going to catch traction while the left tire is still in the mud. And it's going to swing the front of the truck around. And it's going to allow it to move out, but the truck will have turned in the process. That's just an alternative way that I like to think about this sometimes. Now we're going to move to putting a little bit of mathematics behind this with Snell's Law. You can see that I'm filling in my actual numbers for the indices of refraction. So I have 1.008 for air and I also have 1.33 for water. I'm showing my theta locations, theta 1, theta 2, always measured against the normal. That's just material 1 and material 2, by the way, it's fairly arbitrary. In fact, you notice that I have an arrow pointed to the bottom right right now. I'm implying that my light is coming in through the air side of things and it's refracting into the water. The mathematics for that can be done using Snell's Law. Again, what's nice is that even if the light was traveling from the water and refracting into the air, the mathematics for Snell's Law would essentially be the same. So I don't have to worry about that too much when I'm using the equation, uh, but it is nice to point that out. This is the first time that I'm showing you Snell's Law. You can see that it is fairly straightforward here, where the subscripts 1 are just talking about one medium and then going into the second medium. Let's go ahead and pick a number out of thin air. I'm going to choose 62 degrees and use this for a calculation. I have my indices of refraction already. I should plug in all of these numbers, do a little bit of algebra. 
I can get down to this part of the equation and I'll remind you that from here you would use the inverse sine function in order to solve for theta 2. We can find that theta 2 is equal to 42 degrees in this particular example. And so it came in at 62 degrees and it's going to exit or refract at 42 degrees. So it got closer to the normal. In fact, there's a nice thing to remember here. You can always pair the large index refraction with the small angle. And you can always pair the small index refraction with the large angle. Let's use this to explain something about a real life observation. If you're standing knee deep in some water and you just look a little bit out in front of you and you see a fish, the fish is not actually located where your brain thinks the fish is located. Your brain has no reason to believe that light bent at that interface. And so it's going to interpret that the light came in a straight line. It's going to extrapolate into the water and say, well, that must be where the location of the fish was. So I'm showing with this little ghost image of the fish, that's where your brain will tell you that the fish is located. In reality, the light originated from the fish uh, closer to your knees, as I'm showing in this diagram here. That's something that you should certainly keep in mind if you ever get stuck on a desert island and you need to do a little spear fishing. The fish is actually closer to you than what it would appear. We can also use some of these ideas to interpret something that we see here on this nice mountain lake. If you look at this lake and look kind of close up where I'm identifying with this arrow, underneath the water you'll see some rocks. Now the same thing is true about the rocks as it was true for the fish. Those rocks are actually located a little bit closer to you than what your brain is interpreting because of the refraction of light. You'll notice that on top of this you also see some reflection, some of the sky. And if you look a little bit further out, you see an awful lot of reflection, and I can't really see any rocks or anything that are below there. Let's see if we can figure out how this works. What this comes down to is basically a thing of probabilities. And so how much light that's going into your eye came from the location of the rock? And if it's pretty close to you, most of the light that's going to enter your eye is coming from the rock itself. There's a different pathway for light to get directly into your eye, even at that same angle, and that's when it comes from up on the air side of things and reflects off the surface of the water into your eye. But when you're looking relatively close to you, there's a better chance that the light is coming from the rock than it is from this outer part, from the reflection. If you take a slightly different situation where you're lo looking deeper out into the water, then the probability starts to change up on you a little bit. Now there's a higher chance that the water is going to reflect the light that's going to go into your eyeball. There's still some light that must be coming from the fish, but it's in such small amounts compared to the amount of light coming from the reflection that you're not really going to see that, and the reflected light's going to overwhelm the situation for you. That brings us back to where we started. Let's take a look at why this straw looks like it's broken. Remember that the fish was not actually in the same location that you believe it to be because just how our brain interprets the information of light coming into our eyeball. For the part of the straw that's still in the air, light originates at the straw. It's coming from somewhere in the room. It's reflecting off the straw. And from that point, we're saying it originates there. Then it travels through air, then to glass, then from glass to air, then into your eyeball. But when the straw is underwater, the light is still originating from the straw, but this time it has to travel through water, then it's going to bend into glass a little bit, then from glass to air. It ultimately takes a pretty different path to get to your eyeball. That different path is, again, interpreted by your eye, and it's just going to assume that it came from the very straight direction. But you're going to see that, that difference in bending there. We used Willebrod Snell's law in order to figure out some of the mathematics behind this. We only looked at one type of situation in this video where light originated in air and went into water, originated in the low index of refraction and went to the high index of refraction. In the second part to this video, I'm going to look at the situation where light originates in the high index of refraction and travels out into the low index of refraction. That's going to bring up something called total internal reflection. But for this part of the video, if you think you got it figured out, 
let your computer know.